Today is the day, the wonderful, wonderful day, when our hearts are filled with joy because of the amazing, incredible, wonderful victory that you won on our behalf. That we can be rescued, that we should, that we should live in your presence, accepted by you as totally reconciled, is amazing. Lord God, what a gift. Help us to hear this morning the the voice of your Holy Spirit. Help us to be able to truly grasp the gravity of what you have done for us. And Lord God, help us not just to, to listen to it, to hear it, but to live it to live the truth of the resurrection, which is the entire aim of our faith. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Um, We are going to be in the book of Matthew, uh, if you would like to turn there. And last week, um, in preaching on the triumphal entry, I, I talked about what a disappointment Jesus was to his disciples, to the crowds, the people who followed him. And, um, and I sort of floated out there the idea that if you're experiencing disappointment in your Christian life, if you're experiencing disappointment in Jesus, disappointment in the plans that, that God has for you, it's probably evidence, not that you're doing something wrong, but that you're doing something right. Uh, this was the, the universal um, experience of each one of the apostles. Uh, each one of the disciples had to come to a point uh, in their belief in Jesus where they had to go, my God, I was hoping for something else. I... I was hoping you were going to do something else. I was hoping you were going to give me something else. Struggling with our faith, coming to an acceptance of who Jesus really is, I think requires us occasionally to be shocked that eternal life is not getting what I wanted or what I had hoped. And in that way, perhaps Good Friday ought to be renamed, or, or, or this whole uh, uh, experience of, of, of Holy Week, the, the latter part of it, with Christ's passion, his, his death and his burial, instead of being called Good Friday, maybe we should call it What the Heck Weekend. What? This is what you were up to, God? This is what you wrote uh, for the plan for your people since before the foundation of the world? Your promise in the Garden of Eden to Adam and to Eve. A promise that, that the snake one day would be crushed. Your plan was crucifixion and death? I want you to imagine uh, with me for just a moment... What do you think the disciples experienced as Jesus Christ was crucified, dead, and buried? The, the, the tomb sealed? What was their experience like? I, I bet they dealt a little bit with what we call survivor's guilt. Why am I alive? Why is he dead? I think probably they had to deal with with shock that Jesus, they watched Jesus consciously choose for things to turn out the way that they did. Jesus, many times in the Gospels, whenever things were getting out of hand, whenever the Pharisees were getting a little too hot under the collar or the people were ready to like take him and try to declare him king, he was really good at just disappearing. And just, nope, my time's not, not right now. I'm disappearing. And uh, where, where'd he go? We, we want, Jesus would not trust his soul to them, so the gospel tells us. But the disciples watched Jesus not just sort of 
fade into the woodwork and disappear, but to walk forward and say, you looking for me? My hour, my hour is at hand. Peter, Peter, when they came to arrest him, Peter took out his sword. He had just promised Jesus, there, nothing's going to happen to you. I got my sword, you know, nothing's going to happen to you, Lord. He took out his sword when the mob came and he hacked off the ear of the first guy who, in line coming to him. And Jesus stopped him and said, no, Peter, put your sword away. Picked up the guy's ear from off of the ground, put it back on his head and healed it. Like undoing what Peter had done. No, no, no. Jesus actually chose the path that he walked. I bet somewhere in the middle of the night or perhaps yesterday on Saturday when, when all the crowds are, are dispersed and, and, and the streets are all quiet, locked in their house, in some bedroom with their head in their hands, those disciples were just disgusted with their own behavior. How could we have let that happen? How could this have happened? Maybe they were just wondering, what went wrong? What, what would happen if I'd, what if I had, or maybe if I had, and just rerunning the scenarios over and over, what if I would have said this? What if I would have inserted myself there? As often happens with life and death situations, especially with people that we love, we have to go through this sort of never-ending hoop jumping of what could I have done differently? And I guarantee those disciples were sitting around in the quiet of their houses in the dark, just wondering what they did wrong. These were believing men. They were people who knew God. I wonder on Friday evening and Saturday and Saturday night, I wonder what their prayers sounded like. I wonder if the disciples said something like, God, what what did I miss? Things were so clearly pointing that Jesus was the Messiah. He made the claim. He said, I'm the Son of Man. I'm the one who's come. I'm the Messiah. I tell you what, before Abraham was, I am. We watched him walk on water multiple times. We watched him heal people, hundreds, thousands. We watched him turn the bread into multi, you know, to feed a multitude. We watched him go in and teach. And when the Pharisees and the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came to trap him up in his words, he knew the scripture better than they did. And he could sort of turn away all of their, do this like scriptural jujitsu where they, 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 they just couldn't pin him down and go like, aha. Even when he was healing people on the Sabbath, healing people on the Sabbath, miraculous healing on the Sabbath, the best that his enemies could come up with was, you're not supposed to do work on Sundays. I wonder if they thought like, what, what? Did Jesus do something wrong? Did I do something wrong? Maybe their prayer sounded something like, God, I knew that Judas was going to do something. It's all his fault. It went wrong because of him. Peter was no help at all. He's supposed to, you know, lead us and know what's going on and direct us. And Peter had it all wrong. Judas and Peter screwed this thing up. We could have had the exact experience that we wanted had it not been for those two guys. Maybe if they were really honest, they would have said something like, God, you're not holding up your end of the bargain. You said, you said that the Messiah would come in your scripture. You said that he would live eternally and rule eternally. And he's dead. What's wrong with you, God? What's wrong with my doctrine of scripture? Have they been teaching us this stuff all wrong? God, this is terrible. This is a disaster. What am I going to do? I bet those guys actually came to the place where their faith just broke. And they went, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. I want to read for you um, Matthew chapter 27, verses uh, 62 through 66, just the end of Matthew chapter 27 there. This is while Jesus is dead and buried. 
The next day, that is the day after preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go make it secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. These were the chief priests. These were the leaders of the orthodox, faithful church at the time. This would be sort of like a gathering of pastors coming together and going, hey, this Jesus character that uh, scripture predicts is coming back. Well, he's back and we got to do something about it. Now we killed him, but he did predict that he's going to come back alive. How do we make sure that that doesn't happen? In this passage, the chief priests and the Pharisees and the elders display that they had a very crystal clear understanding of who Jesus was. Did you know he never said, after three days I will rise? He never said that. He did teach them in a parable in Matthew chapter 12 and said, when the, the Pharisees and all of the people came to him after he had multiplied the loaves and the fishes and they said, hey, if you're the Messiah, what sign do you do? And he was like, what do you mean, what sign do I do? He had just done miracle after miracle. And they said, we'd like some more bread. They just wanted free bread out of him. And he said, an adulterous people seeks after a sign. I will give it no sign but the sign of Jonah, who was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So also will the Son of Man be. The Pharisees, the chief priests, knew exactly what he was saying. While a lot of the people didn't, they were like, what? What are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. Are you going to give us bread or not? And the Pharisees and the chief priests went, oh my God, he is making a claim that he is going to rise from the dead after three days. They knew that. Here, I think, is one of the most important things that the world needs to know in order to be able to truly celebrate Easter, to truly be able to see the Messiah, you have to see the alternative. The alternative is right here. The alternative to being saved, the alternative to living for Jesus, is to be completely and totally corrupted by the power of the world. This is the church at its worst. The church totally allied with sin and the power of darkness. The church, using its understanding of Scripture and its God-given authority to undermine the real salvation of Jesus Christ, and it is a display of hell on earth. They are totally and completely enslaved to sin. Why are they opposing who they know to be the Messiah sent by God? because he wasn't working for them. That's why. Had Jesus, they approached him very early in his ministry, and they were like, hey, you're a good miracle worker and stuff. Join the team. And Jesus was like, I'm on God's team. And that caused them to go, oh my goodness, we have to find some way to nuke this guy's ministry. And they became antagonists from then on because Jesus said, he was on God's team, that he was working for God, that his authority was from heaven. They didn't want that. They wanted his authority to be from them. That is hell on earth. Hell on earth is being so enslaved to sin that even when we understand Jesus, we work to undermine and destroy his ministry Hell is total and complete moral corruption, a seared conscience, always striving for what I want and always coming up empty. That's hell on earth. That's what these people are doing right here, right now. 
But do you know? That does not threaten God in the least. God's not like, oh, man, the people who are leading my church, they're, they're screwing everything up. I can't work now. I've got to do something to appease them to whatever so that my ministry can go forward. No, he actually uses these evil people in their work against him to ensure that the testimony is true. Not even The Romans didn't even secure the tomb. Had the Romans secured the tomb, then the Pharisees would have been able to say, the Romans are in on it. The Romans are trying to do that to undermine our authority, and they would have gotten antagonistic with Rome, which they so often did. But because Pilate said, I give you the authority to make it as secure as you can, and they went and they made it very, very secure. But did it keep Jesus Christ from rising from the grave? No, no not in the least. In fact, It was something they had to then contend with because it was their, it was their security that failed. So they had to find some way to try to make it seem like their failure was an honest mistake and that these people who were followers of Jesus, who had been demonstrated to be terrified people, who ran away at the slightest thing going wrong, If we're always working for ourselves, we will be locked in hell on earth. But the story does not end there. Matthew chapter 28. And if you can, just imagine what it would have been like to be one of those disciples who's had their entire world destroyed. Everything that that was important to them comes crashing down, or so it seems. But then on, on the day after the Sabbath... Sunday, which we now call the Lord's Day for this very reason, this very scripture. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Now, these Marys are known, and and in each one of the Gospels, the Gospel writers to go out of their way to show that these women were totally in love with Jesus just totally and completely in love with Jesus. They were not people of prominence. In fact, Mary Magdalene was a demon-possessed prostitute that Jesus befriended and and saved, drove out the demons, and she became one of his female disciples. And this other Mary, which either is his mom or another, there's like three Marys. So they're going to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Now remember, this tomb is sealed. They've sealed the rock and they've posted a guard. And there's a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Can you see it? The tomb now broken open, an angel of the Lord dressed in flashing lightning rolls back the stone and sits on it. The guard hasn't gone anywhere. They haven't run away. They're all with their swords and their spears laying down on the ground in complete and total trembling. And that is always the way of the world when confronted with the power of God. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. That's way up north. There you will see him. See I told you. While all of these soldiers who are armed and and in a team, while they are all laying on the ground like, like they're dead, all of their strength sapped out of them, the angels standing there, the women, these humble women, are up and moving around. Why? Because they love the Lord. They aren't seeking their own position, their own wealth, their own power. 
They just wanted to anoint Jesus. That's all they wanted to do. And so they get the distinguished place as being the first people to see the risen Christ, the first disciples of the resurrected Lord who ran with the message, he's not dead, he's alive. This great honor was given to a demon-possessed, a former demon-possessed prostitute. And so they departed quickly. This is verse 8. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! They came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers, go to Galilee, and there they will see me. My imagination just is near to bursting when I think of what it might have been like to be one of these women, totally in, in love with Jesus, more than their concern for what someone might think of them, what someone might say to them, whether they will be great in the world or not, rich or poor. They don't care about those things. They just want to go and take care of Jesus' body. Then these guards were laying down as dead in his presence, but the women standing and being encouraged and being sent to, pe- to tell about Christ crucified. Were they? Did they have their own disappointments? Yeah, for sure. But they were the first to recover because they cared more about what Jesus was doing and what Jesus wanted than their own desires. Their response to the risen Lord, which I'm not sure if greetings, I think it roughly translates here as like, surprise! Talk about the biggest shock, the biggest surprise of your life to be totally and completely filled with disappointment. And wondering, God, how, how did, how did you screw this up? To all of a sudden having the real and risen Jesus standing there before you saying, what's up? And it causes them to grab a hold of his feet and to worship him, which is the correct response. And Jesus says, go. Don't be afraid. Because they were filled with fear and joy. And he says, Just get rid of the fear. Just the joy. Hang on to that. Go and tell. Go and tell my brothers, not my slaves, not my disciples, not those people who disappointed me, not those guys who I've I've heard their prayers in their, in, in, in the bedroom that they've been praying while I've been conquering sin and death and hell on their behalf. And wow, are they ever foolish prayers. None of that. He calls them his brothers and promises they will see me. Now, We have to have a little flashback to what happens to these guards because the women are gone now, Jesus is gone now, and all these guards at some point recover their strength and they get up. Now these guys have actually been in the presence of the risen Jesus. They have first-hand account and knowledge. What do they do with it? While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city. So they they leave the tomb, they run into the city, and they tell the chief priests everything that had taken place. You know that guy who said he was going to rise again in three days? He did it. You know how you told us, don't let anybody come and take his body? They didn't. And we had swords and clubs and spears, and, 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 and it was sealed. The rock was sealed. They concreted the edge of the rock so that it couldn't be moved, but it moved. What are we supposed to do? We couldn't resist him at all. We could not even, we could not even stand up and be like, hey, you know, you gotta stay in there. You can't come out. When they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. Which, by the way, if you are a soldier of any era, and something happens while you've been posted on watch, and your excuse is, oh, I'm sorry, I was asleep, uh, you'll die. 
maybe not today they won't shoot you, but, but, but you're not going to be with the team anymore. You're going to be demoted down to nothing, and your career is absolutely over. These guys would have actually been put to death. This is the... This is treachery of the highest order in the soldiering world. But they're being told, here, here's a, a good chunk of money. We just want you to say that you fell asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So what did they do? They said, keep your dirty money. Are you crazy? I'm not saying that. I'm telling the truth. No. They took the money and did as they were directed, directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day, which that is a total and complete display of the power of hell. This is what it is like to not be reconciled to God. They wanted what, what bought their complicity? Money? and they didn't want to be in trouble. Money, and they didn't want to be in trouble. And I am so shocked at how many people today, good people, can be bullied into doing stuff they know isn't right, isn't good, either for money, aka they don't want to lose their job, or they just don't want to be in trouble. What kind of trouble, you would ask? Like these guys, you know, stood to be killed. But it's more like, I don't want people to say something mean about me. Wow. Wow. That is what it is like to not be reconciled to God. These men know, but they are filled with other desires. What's good for me is different than what is good. And because they want to stay out of trouble, because they want to gain money, and because they want to be somebody, they act here as the very enemies of Jesus Christ. What would you choose? There is no third way. There is no third way. There is only two sides. And all the only choice we have is to pick a side. Now, this very report being included in the gospel suggests that some of these soldiers later came to faith and provided the report for the gospel writer. So there's hope. You can switch sides. But we have to get to this very last, this very last bit here in verse 16 on. Imagine these disciples. Now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee. So they heard the report from the women. They went on a road trip up to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Perfect! That is the Christian faith summed up in a sentence. To be full of worship and doubt. That's normal. That's a part of what it means to be a Christian. But our doubt can be addressed by Christ himself. And so in verse 18, Jesus comes and he says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Surprise! What happens to all of that disappointment when all of a sudden Jesus shows up and says, no, it isn't what you wanted, it's better. No, not you getting rich, not you being somebody, not you getting that bureaucracy appointment you had really hoped to sit at my right hand or on my left so that you could tell people what to do. I know that's what you wanted. I'm giving you something else, something better. All authority on heaven, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. People of God, we are commissioned by Jesus Christ himself with the authority to forgive people of their sins, 
to preach the name of Jesus Christ that all people can be saved by believing in Him. They are commanded not only to preach the name of Jesus and to tell them all that Jesus had said and done, but He commanded them to go and to make disciples. This, I think, the modern evangelical church has virtually all but lost. We have fallen for this false belief that Jesus here, when he addresses his disciples before ascending into heaven, said, gentlemen, make sure that somewhere deep down in your heart, you have some kind of a feeling of positivity towards God. That's all you need. That's all I want. And tell others that if they've ever had some sort of a positive thought towards me, that's all there is. No. He doesn't say, hey, develop a really good private faith that nobody would be aware of unless you specifically talked about faith. And don't talk about that. Talk about other stuff. No. He says, go and tell them. Go and tell them all that I commanded. Teach them. Teach people. The essence of the Christian faith is not only to believe, but to go and do. Jesus said, you will, you will be able to tell the type of tree by the type of fruit that comes out of it. There has to actually be some kind of fruit. And this isn't to make anyone feel guilty. It's to make us all feel an incredible amount of hope that God says a life of vital and vivacious faith is completely possible by only believing. And then Jesus commands them to baptize and to teach obedience. And before he goes, he says, I'll be with you always. Our celebration in Easter is trying to move from that ultimate disappointment that God, God's position in our life is not to give us everything we want. And to move from there to being surprised. To being surprised that God instead takes care of everything we need. Not, not what we wanted. Not the frivolous and stupid things that sin tells us to want but instead to take and give to us exactly what our souls need. And that is, and that is a complete and opposite relationship than the world has. The world looks at God and says, what good are you to me? What can you do for me? And in fact, we even conceive of eternal life as essentially like the fountain of youth, your life will be really, really good and go on forever and ever. But that's not what eternal life is. Eternal life is a relationship with God made right forever. And that is what Christ offers to us. Surprise? We have to go from being disappointed to being surprised. And in our surprise, we can be full of Easter laughing and joy. So here's where I want to conclude my sermon. Uh, there is a term uh, in common parlance uh, called virtue signaling. Has anybody heard this word, virtue signaling? Uh, so it means something like stating political slogans or doing political tasks or attacking someone who doesn't fall in line. And you do that publicly so that you can get others to think of you as a good person. And there is some great hope that we live in a day and age where people deeply want to be a good person. But we have been corrupted by thinking that being a good person can be shifted around with political ideas. That's You'll only ever be chasing your tail. You'll only ever be doing things that other people think are important. And they'll say, I'll think well of you if you do this. 
But instead, Jesus Christ offers us to, to have something better than that. Not other people thinking well of us, but having God himself call us righteous, believe us righteous. If you gain the entire world, you still are going to die. You still have to face God at some point. What good would it be if Jesus Christ did everything that the chief priests wanted or everything that the disciples wanted, if he became some kind of machine that grants wishes, if Jesus Christ was like a genie from the tale of Arabian Nights, would that be good? No. It would be terrible. Why? Because we're lost in sin. And we want things that actually aren't good. But if we can have peace with God, we have gained more than the world can offer. And that is what God gives to us. More than that, look at these disciples who have gone from, from these self-aggrandizing divas to disciples who went from being terrified of other people, what other people thought, what the crowds might do, to being bold lions, living abundantly in righteousness and united completely to the Lord. These are the gifts that Jesus Christ gives to us to have a strength of character that cannot be had without him because the human character is corrupted to its core without being made right with God. Easter is an invitation to move from disappointment, to move from, from being like angry at God and in opposition to Him, to accepting the surprise that Jesus Christ has made us alive and that we have been made right with God forever and ever. Amen. We can go to living for self, to living for the Lord. And so Easter ultimately is an invitation to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that Jesus Christ is the Son of Man, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the great I Am, the King of the ages, the Lion of Judah. He is the great physician by whom we are healed. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the fountain of life. He is the good shepherd. He is the alpha and the omega in whom all who call on his name will be saved. So it is a good morning. And we can have that by simply calling on the name of the Lord. So I want to invite you to stand with me and let's worship God.